What a lovely hole. I will leave my lucky amulet here and pop down the shops. You stay there safe, lad. Wizard's Tower on the ZX Spectrum 48K. There's no loading screen. There's no running screen. That's because it's missing an action. Clicking through on Spectrum Computing, we find out it was from the magazine Personal Computer World, a type-in from the 1984 January supplement Game Special, and it's by Mr. Tony Hetherington. Clicking through the game, we can see the cover of the Game Special, but then a link to it on archive.org. Going to that link on archive.org, takes us to Personal Computer World of January 1984, but not the Game Supplement. Get off my lawn. Fortunately, I bought the actual Game Supplement on eBay, so let's have a look. Looking at the cover, we have a board game at the top, some kind of fighter action game, then pinball, an adventure game with elephants, and some Tarzan Man. Turning the page, we have lots of adverts for games, Galactic Software, Commodore 64. Look at those, games, something completely different. And there's Davey Travis's Monster Challenge, we enter a competition to win £10,000. Lots of nice games here, lots of things to look at, and hopefully lots of fun type-ins. The usual adverts explaining how games work, the general concept, advert for Logic 3, whatever that might be, arcade reviews, Phantom Slayer was reviewed by Gargapunk, Aquaplay, not seen many type-ins yet, Maziax is an excellent game, uh, a version of Mazogs on the ZX81, but that's the Spectrum version. And we keep going, uh, more adverts, more reviews... No type-ins as yet. I'd like to have some more type-ins, please. Oh, that's Indiana Jones, the Dan Diamond Trilogy. Oh, that looks good. From Salamander Software. Um, oh, here's Adventure Games. This will be good. Yes, there's there's your pith helmet man, your elephants and your Tarzan stabbing a lion. All about rules, limitations. Yes. Get off my lawn. All right, Dudley, calm yourself. Lots of reviews of text adventures. The Hobbit, which is excellent. Hell's Temple, Snowball, Deadline, Feasibility Experiment. Uh, where's the type-in? Can I have a type-in, please? I wanted a game. Come on. Full-page advert with Dracula not sleeping well. Get off my lawn. And finally, we have a type-in on the bottom right of the screen in really tiny font. The game is Wizard's Tower. It starts there. We have explanatory text and another two pages of typing. Very small type. And the final page of typing with suggestions for improvements and lovely notes. Get on my lawn! Mr. Hetherington notes that some of the adventure games he played while writing the article were written by 13 year olds, so there's no reason why you can't write one yourself. Wizard's Tower, which follows, is a game that he's written which we, he thinks we might like to play. It's an unusual game, because you're not a hero as such, you're a monster. Is that an amulet I spy? <coughs> oh ho! It's full of Spanish fly! This wallpaper is really dire. I'll turn this house into a pyre! <laughs> Four directions and then one. Alive must I be brought to the hot gun. Looking to get into some bad habits? <laughs> Why, hello there! What the hell? I reckon it's that bastard wizard! I'll get you! And my amulet too! Ooh. 
but not just any monster, you're a unique monster you create yourself. Before we can enact our quest for revenge... Monster, monster, that's what they call me. We need to work out what kind of monster we are. Can you fly? Of course I can fly. What do you think I've got these wings for, you slag? Okay. What about your offensive capabilities? Can you breathe fire? Oh, I think I had a good curry. You bet I can breathe fire. Can you shoot lightning bolts? Zip zap, motherfucker! Very impressive. What about your defensive capabilities? Are you resistant to flame, for instance? Bastard, nice. How well do you do against acid? 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 Acid's got nothing on me. Ah, uh, like nectar. What about poison? Poison? Not really American American hair band music, mate, mate. Nah, I like more dire straits. And the quo! Fair enough. You wouldn't happen to be amphibious, would you? Do I look like a frog? More like some winged wolf fairy. Can you do fearsome? Now fearsome? You want to see fearsome? Terrifying. Uh Uh-oh. Looks like a bat is on the way to warn the wizard. You better get in there and find that amulet. You haven't much time before the wizard returns, but beware. The tower has been built to keep out intruders. After a five second beep, we get this little screen here explaining his use of the poke command. He's poking 23692, which of course is the scroll count. If you don't have this, after a number of lines, the spectrum will say, scroll, and you have to reply, yes. By poking this repeatedly to 255, the spectrum will keep scrolling indefinitely. It looks like there were some issues with the poking of this, with some versions of the spectrum. He just says, in this case, Just turn it out and just say yes. Now into the monster selection. First thing you do is choose your attack strength. You have 50 points to spend. This is the attack strength. This is used in combat with barbarians. Uh, I'm choosing 10 here, which is the number suggested in the magazine. Then there's destructive ability, which is your ability to smash through walls. The magazine suggests 8, so put that in. Then there's constitution, which is your ability to withstand damage. The magazine suggests 20, so I'm going to put that in. Then we have a number of questions about our special abilities. Are we able to fly? Each of these has a point value. The magazine has the game flying. The ability to fire lightning bolts, which we don't have. Having fiery breath, which we do have. So we can fly and we can breathe fire. Are we resistant to fire? Yes, it's quite handy having you able to resist your own breath. We are vulnerable to acid though. Are we poison resistant? Yes. Are we amphibious? No. Are we fearful? No. Then ask to enter the speed. This is the speed of the game, not of you. This is how long the pauses are. And we spent too many points after to start again. This is using the example from the magazine. So I'll try again, but this time I have slightly less in constitution. It doesn't tell you what points you've spent or how many points you have left or how much anything costs, but these are all in the magazine, which you have next to you because you've just typed it in, you see. And away we go. We're in a room with brick walls, a stone floor and a strange luminous yellow roof. There is a way north and west. A whoosh of air as ten arrows are fired at you from the walls and four arrows hit you. So now move. The centre of the tower is now to the east. I'm in a room with brick walls, a stone floor and a strange luminous yellow roof. There's a way north. Move again. The centre of the tower is now to the southeast. Which is interesting. I went north and now it's... Yeah, that might work. Uh, As I look around, this room is the same. The floor retreats, leaving you surrounded by channels full of oil which suddenly leaps into flames. A dwarf appears and shoots arrows at you. I walk through the flames, it dies down. Uh Uh-oh, here comes a barbarian.
He hits you, I strike him. We hit each other for a while. I killed the barbarian. Huzzah! Move again. All the rooms are described exactly the same. Mr. Hetherington notes that the descriptions aren't most exciting. However, as a monster, you're not that interested. Now, we've crashed out now. I've subscript wrong. I've tried to bash my way through a wall and this has instantly failed. So let's look at list 801. And we're looking at what are the exits. It looks for the correct exit based on the action number. North, south, east, west, up, down are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Bash north, bash south, bash east and bash west are 7, 8, 9 and 10. There are only 6 exits. The room array is 8 long. 6 exits. The 7th character is what's in the room. And the 8th is the direction to the centre of the tower. So you can bash north and bash south. The results will be unpredictable. By bashing east... We get a subscript out of range. This is correct. I've typed it in as in the magazine. It just doesn't quite work. We now get a C nonsense in basic error on line 8055. 8055 looks at what the action is based on what actions are available for the room with the R code based on the action number. However, that's not right. That looks like exits. But it's not exits, it's nine long, but actions are actually 16 long. So, so something strange has happened. What actually happens is on line 8800. Line 8800 sets a room to be as it was before, but with the letter M in place of the eighth character. Unfortunately, the code as written doesn't do that to the room array, M string, but to the action array, A string. I've restarted the game just to see what's going on here. So moving around, the, moving around the tower, each room is described exactly the same with different exits. So I headed north, but I now can't go south. The centre of the tower was northwest. I went north, and now the centre of the tower is to the east. What's happening here? Could it be magic? And I've been hit by arrows, and I've died. And they've added my head to the wizard's collection. Let's fix some bugs. This is the bug fix version. I've corrected the subroutine at line 8800, which sets the room back to normal. That's, that was an easy fix. You change A string to M string. I've also added some code around the 8100 mark, which caters for the action number being higher than 6, if you're bashing through a wall. Too bad. I'm still not enormously happy with the game. The map doesn't seem to quite make sense. There are some other issues I have. You're looking for an amulet. You can search a room by pressing Z. Unfortunately, the amulet does not exist until you reach a certain room. Once you reach a certain room, the amulet is then, is then placed in the maze. It doesn't tell you this, though, and there's no way you could know this. So that's not really ideal. There's a lot of confusion. Some things just don't work. If you choose to be fearful, or really actually be fearsome rather than you being a coward, it has zero effect on the game. There is a part where I typed in go sub 8300 because it tells me to. In fact, that should be 8800. It's a printing mistake, because if you look really carefully with a, with a magnifying glass at the text, you can see it's not a 3, because the top of the number is not straight. However, as a kid, you're not really going to be able to solve that. 8300 does not exist, so you'll fall through to 8500, which is the you die subroutine. So if you fall down a pit, you either die from the spikes, or you survive the spikes, and then die anyway. Another thing I had to fix was the exits were off by one if you bash through a wall. I noticed this because I bashed through the wall going south and ended up in the same room. I ain't I been here before? There are some suggestions for improvement made by Mr. Hetherington. You could suggest adding room descriptions, which could be in text or in graphics or both. You could add new trap, change the order of traps, which could be having a two-player version with one person designing a the tower, the other person catching it in. You could add in new monster abilities or other more complex defenders. And as he says, the main thing is to experiment and to have fun. Let's make it better. Oh, brilliant. My amulet. I love that. Thank you. <coughs> Lovely jubbly. Oh no, the wizard. Intruder cower. Foolish dolt! Feel my power! Lightning bolt! 
In order to snorkify, first we must understand. I was trying to work out the map, create a PowerPoint presentation, SCIENCE! Making a note of every exit of every room. From room 4 we go north to room 2, south to room 5, and then from room 5 we go north to 3, and then west to 4. We go west to 2. So that looks okay. Yeah, two, three, four, five. But room two doesn't work. And for room five, we go north to three. Yeah, that's okay. Room four, north to two. But then we go south to five. So it doesn't really work. However, if you swap the exits over, so east and west are swapped, Then from room 5, we go north to room 3, and then west to room 4. From room 4, we go north to room 2, east to room 5. From room 3, we go south to room 5, which is fine. And west to room two. And room two, we go south to room four and east to room three. Simples. Then I thought, right, let's try and work out how the centre of the tower works. So I wrote every single room on a piece of paper and put them on the floor. Starting at the top, we see that the tower has several floors. The very top of the tower is the centre. Then we go down the level. And each room is offset from the centre. But again, this makes sense. And I then found that actually most of the tower really did work. Apart from two rooms, rooms 14 and 17. Room 14 being, of course, the start room, which doesn't help. If you change those directions, then the map makes sense. This makes things a bit easier to understand. Whenever I snorkify a game, I like to add a loading screen as a test of my artistic abilities, as well as a mark of respect to the original creators. I always like to give the proper credit on these loading screens. Using the bottom two rows is a good place to put that. But to do that, you have to do some poking because you can't do the normal save screen. This is the loading screen. We've got a wizard's tower on the top left, the wizard in the middle, the wizard's tower title in big chunky graphics. The bottom two lines in a rather attractive font is copyright Tony Heatherington 1984, the PCW Games Special. That font is font number 31 from Roberto Colombo's Charbank. On loading the game, the screen goes blank. It then says, please wait, while the border cycles between blue, red, magenta and green. This is doing a fair amount of work. So rather than you waiting, thinking it's crashed, I give you an indication that something's progressing. But what is it doing? Here's the source. We start with a clear 61999, tells the spectrum that 62,000 and above is my memory, not, not its. We've got various things in that memory. The first thing is going to be the font, which is uh, nice and pretty. But then there's more stuff we're going to stick up in high memory. So let's now look at line 100. We go straight away to Ghost of 9400. What's up there? And here we are. It's a rather chunky line, line 9400, starting with border 1, which sets the border to blue. We then do a restore, which tells you it's a data command. Then we do a bit of poking. Poking 23676. Now 23675 is the 2-byte address of the user-defined graphics. And what we're doing is changing the high byte, the one which is the most important one, and we're changing that to 254. We're then doing a series of pokes to define user-defined graphics. We then change the border to two, do some more pokes, change the border to three, do some more pokes. So we have four different sets of user-defined graphics. At 252, 253, 254, and 255. And by doing these pokes, we're going to see here, that's the uh, face of the monster, the lower part of the face of the monster. At 254, we get to the top of the monster's head by poking it to 253, 
so 252 sorry we get the the wizard's tower and that's how you use multiple banks of user defined graphics i learned this trick from britain invaded it's well documented it's never thought i thought it was a lot harder than it was it's actually quite simple the key thing you do is before you start poking stuff into memory is do your clear first otherwise you can get some strange corruptions but how did i create all this user defined graphics a user defined graphic on the spectrum is a series of eight bytes poked into memory each byte is a row of eight pixels, and you set these with individual bit flags, 128, 64, 32, etc. I created a spreadsheet and created squares of eight by eight cells, and then set conditional formatting for each column, so that if the first column was 128, then the cell will be filled in, otherwise not filled in. And then this then let, let you have big chunky graphics. And at the bottom, you then do some maths where you add up these rows of eight cells to give you a number. And then you add up these numbers and put them into a string. And then you just use that for your user-defined graphics. You then make a note on the right-hand side which graphic it is. You add 21 user-defined graphics per bank, A to U. If you run out, you then have to start on another bank. With the monster... I split the bank early, around halfway along the face, to make it easier to cope with. The wizard's tower and the wizard's face only required one bank. Quite elegant, I thought. After we've done all that initialization, we get the splash screen. It's the loading screen again. Very quick to draw, because I'm not drawing it, I'm printing user-defined graphics. We then drop through to the question-answer session, where we design our monster. I've made some quality of life improvements. I tell you how many points you have to spend and how many points you have left. You enter your attack strength as before, your destructive ability and your constitution. Then we get on to the questions. I've added one new ability, but I've also added some drawback. Are you vegetarian? This gives you bonus five points. If you're vegetarian, you obviously don't eat meat. This is a drawback in the wizard's tower. There's also colour blindness. I noticed in the original game all the ceilings were yellow. I decided to give them individual colours, but you don't see them if you're colour blind, which makes navigation a bit harder. Then into the standard, can you fly, shoot lightning, breathe fire, I've corrected the spellings. Fire resistance, acid resistance, poison resistance, are you slimy? Is a new one. No, he didn't ask if I was fearsome. I can't afford to be fearsome. Fearsome costs five points. Fearsome now has an important role in the game, if you choose it. Slime just leaves a slimy trail behind you. In the original, speed only affects how long messages pause. In my version, it also affects how long you have to find your amulet. So it's a, another difficulty setting. A few things to note. The border is now turquoise because the ceiling is turquoise. Each room has a unique ceiling. There are only limited colours for the border, so they are grouped. But it gives you a aid to navigation, but not if you're colourblind, of course. I've also changed it so rather than 10 arrows being fired at you, of which 1 to 9 hit, 6 arrows are fired at you, of which 2 to 6 hit. This is because in the original game, you could die very easily in the first room, especially if you are not resistant to poison, because arrows do double damage. I've also added extra enemies, as well as the barbarian, there are also three other monsters you can face. A cactus man, a plant man, and a mysterious metal man. The Metal Man and the Ice Man have weaknesses. The Cactus Man can be eaten by vegetarians. Also, when you fight, I'm having to make little beeps if you get hit or if you manage to strike your opponent. If you defeat the Barbarian and are not vegetarian, you get to feast on his flesh, which restores your strength. I also tell you which way you go. Either if you go means you go through a door, or you smash your way in a different direction, which means you've bashed your way through the wall. Here's the spiky green plant man getting the better of us. And we die. Of course, when we die, our head is added to the wizard's trophy wall. And I started to depict that using these user-defined graphics. We need two banks of the monster's head, and your head is, of course, placed on a trophy shield on the wall. But what about winning? At the start of the game, you're in the place you need to get to at the end, and I tell you that this is the entrance to the tower, and remind you when you go back there. There are also two other rooms where you can exit the tower, but only if you're winged. So if you do have wings, I'll say, 
there are, there's a balcony here. You can exit the tower here when you find the amulet. What about finding the amulet? Remember in the original game, you had to visit a certain room before the amulet would have even appear, and it didn't tell you. Here I tell you, you breached the wizard's inner sanctum, and something magical has happened, and the amulet is now gettable. Certain attacks are poisonous. If you're not resistant to poison, you take extra damage. And I will actually tell you this in the text with the, oh, you're poisoned. I wonder if you run out of time. Well, we know the wizard appears and kills you with a flash of lightning. I've used S. Robert Spiel's lightning routine, which is a done entirely in basic, to give a little bit of pizzazz to this. It's very rare to happen because you really do have plenty of time. But here it is. Here's the barbarian encountering you. Unfortunately, for him, you're fearsome. By Crumb's beard! <laughs> Searching for the amulet does eventually get results. Here it is. Don't do what I've repeatedly done while playing the game and forget to pick it up. When you do find the amulet and pick it up and make your way to one of the possible exits, then you win and you get a victory screen of the monster fists in the air wearing his amulet with pride. Thank you for watching, and thanks to Dudley of Yesterzine for being a good sport. Oh, say, oh, my lovely amulet. Now, I better start rebuilding, and I? Nick. I shall rise again.